Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Miller. I'm a PhD student in the psychology department at the University of Toronto. And uh, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to present at Wyden. I'm going to discuss each of the following topics. So we got memes, viral phenomena, image macros, meme lab, and computer simulations. And if you read the blurb to my talk, then I'm also going to talk about a few other things, kittens, political revolutions, and Gangnam style. And so you don't miss it, Clippy's going to help us uh, take note of uh, when that comes up. So let's just jump right in. What's a meme? Uh, if you were looking at popular media for a, a definition of the word, so the New York Times, then you might get uh, the idea that maybe a meme is sort of like a joke, or maybe it's a picture. Certain aspects of the picture get copied again and again uh, in different ways. Or maybe it's just an online thing, like how every internet argument ends with somebody getting compared to Hitler. But we don't, actually do not need to guess, despite the way the word is used in modern times, we uh, have a definition from Richard Dawkins uh, almost 40 years ago in The Selfish Gene. He says, we need a name for the new replicator, a noun that conveys the idea of a unit of cultural transmission or a unit of imitation. So mimim comes from a suitable Greek root, but I want a monosyllable that sounds a bit like gene. So I hope my classicist friends will forgive me if I abbreviate mimim to meme. It should be pronounced to rhyme with cream. So Dawkins gives us an example of the arch as a classic meme. So here is an arch in ancient Greece. 600 years later, here's an arch in Rome. Here's a totally different kind of arch in the United States. So if an arch is a meme, then we can't, uh, we can't say this is a, a picture thing. A meme is not a picture. Clearly, memes are not restricted to the internet either. Memes really are things that we do, and it's a part of how we work as people. So the Occupy movement, I think, demonstrates the, all the trappings of a good meme. Maybe it's a little hard to see, but I'm pointing out the date there. It says September 17th. By the time Occupy reached Toronto, the ideas had uh, already been adapted to a new context. There's a different aesthetic. You see the date here is October 15th, so it's a month later. But the Occupy movement didn't start in Wall Street. Um, Adbusters, a Canadian magazine, adapted ideas from the Occupy Dotteron protest. And this actually occurred, uh, that's July 30th, a month and a half before Wall Street. So this demonstrates the, uh, the flow of memes from one region to another, from one group of people to another. And as they're flowing, uh, well, while we have a meme on our mind, we could, um, we could be thought of as hosting the meme, we'll say. So we use a variety of tools to communicate online, and memes can flow along any one of these channels uh, that's created by these tools. And the social graph, is, we're going to just define this right now as consisting of all of our social connections, whether explicit, like in Facebook, you have a list of friends, or implicit, like an academic mailing list you might happen to belong to, and you just bump into each other through the mailing list. And here, the term graph means network. And what we have here is a hashtag. It says uh, UTSC widen. Now, this is just demonstrating how um, it's a convention on Twitter for grouping similar comments uh, so that other people can find them later on. That's a hashtag. And at the beginning, this little at sign is how you directly address a Twitter message to another person. So OK, so uh, what we're talking about here is some, some Twitter conventions. This is how you address something to somebody. This is how you group conversations. Uh, what I'm going to show you is the hashtag January 25th, uh, immediately following the re uh, resignation of the Egyptian president last year. Each dot represents a person, and a line between two dots is uh, one message being passed to another person. So the, the first movers, here we can even do this again because it's so fast. The first movers, they all kind of collect in the middle, and their tweets don't go very far. But later on, better connected users come along, and they notice the hot topics and amplify it, becoming hubs of influence. So you can see where some of the people end up branching off to all sorts of different people. And that entity looks familiar, a little bit like other forms of life that we've seen elsewhere. So we call this viral because, well, maybe the idea behaves a little bit like it's contagious. So let's actually talk about viral. Uh, this is a music video uh, uploaded to YouTube three months ago that got a pretty impressive number of views. It's uh, called Gangnam Style by the Korean pop star Psy. And not surprisingly, it's really well liked. Um, this is a notable feature, at least from a psychological perspective, because 
it's one thing to watch a video, and it's quite another to actually log in with your password and then go through a whole bunch of hoops to actually click a button just to signify that you liked watching the thing. And actually, the Guinness Book of World Records just certified this as uh, being the most liked video in history so far. Whatever, it's only 2012, we've got a whole lot of time, but that's the one so far. The top graph here is uh, graphing views over time. And we start January or uh, July 15th, and we go to uh, the present day. And there's an inflection point, maybe right around there, um, where it sort of curves up a little bit farther. But then the growth seems to be pretty much linear from that point on. And you know what? Uh, what's 500 million views anyway? Well, the lunar landing got 500 million views. And maybe it's not exactly comparable, but it almost seems to cheapen the significance of getting 500 million views nowadays when you can just put a music video online and do it. Um, the astronauts actually had to work a lot harder for their own 500 million. But we're talking about image macros now. This astronaut picture is an example of an image macro, and it's a class of memes um, that use images in this style where there are words put on top of it. And the best definition I've found for image macro comes from an online forum called Something Awful. Uh, an image macro is a combination of a picture plus a short catchphrase. In older form incarnations, there were a number of default macros that could be summoned using this IMG macro um, hyphenation. Um, that's where the image macro term came from. And I love this part at the bottom. Using um, bannable catchphrases as part of a macro is still bannable. Um, there's this social context to the whole thing. Image macros are not without precedent, so here's an example of a picture and a catchphrase. And I wouldn't be the first to ask if, if these greeting cards or birthday cards um, were a way of peering into psychological processes. Uh, all the way in 1981, uh, Cassiopeia and Anderson did find sex differences between boys and girls in terms of the cards that their parents gave them. But image macros are the new thing, and this one is particularly famous. I Can Has Cheeseburger was a really influential lol cat, or LOL, laughing out loud cat, that inspired a blog, and the blog sold to a comedy company, and the comedy company just raised $30 million, as you see last year, to grow their image macro empire. So we're not talking memes generally, or videos, or, or anything. We are really talking about pictures with words on them, $30 million. So here's an image macro based on the college freshman meme. So as with the Occupy movement, the meme is going to demonstrate a lot of characteristics of Dawkins' original definition. So it represents the culture of the person creating the image macro. And there are a whole bunch of different ones here. You can see how it's modified as it's shared online. Image macros actually permit great freedom of expression. And if any of you have seen this, if you recognize this, uh, so, incidentally, the guy actually, um, or the, the image came from a Reader's Digest magazine, and this guy, Griffin uh, Kirsty, he was a New Hampshire freshman who says he didn't really want his picture taken, um, but that it went into the magazine, and he didn't think of it for three years, and then this whole internet fame thing. So, let's actually look at an image macro, and let's look at the sharing process. So, I am person A. And that's an image macro. And you know, I'm looking at the image macro, and it might cause me to think about somebody that I want to share it with. So what I'm doing here is I'm making a prediction about the other person's preferences. So I go ahead, share the image macro with my friend. My friend then thinks about it. So he's looking at it. He's thinking about it. And here's where the important distinction happens. So if my prediction was wrong, and then my friend's not going to like it, and he might end up ignoring it. But uh, in the event that my prediction is right, there is a chance that my friend's going to like it so much that he's going to go ahead and reshare it. And when this reshare to ignore ratio is sufficiently high, then this is one way of operationalizing viralness. So um, let's get scientific. In order to understand viral phenomena, we're going to look at memes and not just any memes, but of course, we're going to look at image macros here. So I built a website for this experiment called memeate.com, and I'm going to demonstrate it in the following video. It goes quick, but a participant picks a background picture. Uh, then they put words at the top of the picture and at the bottom of the picture, and they can edit that a few times. And then when they're all done, they can share it on Facebook or use this QR code or the URL. They can paste it into chat and uh, emails. Uh, however, they can share it how they want. However, it's natural to share that. So we recruited 118 UTSC undergrads. And one of the most surprising things I found was that 50% had already made memes coming into the um, experiment. So a little bit more about that later. 
But um, this is an example of one meme created by an actual participant. They're riffing on the Lazy College Senior meme to make a point about the proximity to the IC building. And I don't know, the truth is it's a good idea. So you can, it's, it's funny because it's true, I don't know. So because I ran my own web server, I was able to log all the activity on Meme Lab for a two month period. And each time an image macro was viewed, I counted that basically in a spreadsheet. And this is a time series plot that depicts the uh, number of image views over time. And if we plot it by frequency, the number of views that each meme received, you see most received almost none, but you know, very few received a ton, relatively. So that, for our purposes, that's viral. So in our analysis, we created a model that predicted hits, but I'm actually showing you here a model of intention to share. Because we're going to come back to this one and um, actually dig into a simulation of this specific model. So as luck would have it, and completely apart from my control, uh, students all across North America went crazy for memes in the spring of 2012. And it actually peaked uh, during the first week of data collection. Uh, so we started in February, and uh, February 6th is pretty much the peak. So this is probably why so many students had already created memes before um, they came into the lab. It just randomly got really popular. And the University of Toronto is definitely represented here. I think it's pretty meaningful, actually, that there's more than 10,000 students liking this page. That sounds like maybe one in seven students. And I'm not really sure of any other university event, official or unofficial, that has one in seven students doing something. But behold. So anyway, whatever. I defended my thesis in September in spite of all of that. It was awesome. So let's start pulling things together here. So there's memes, there's viral phenomena, there's image macros, and there's meme lab, uh, which is where we actually measured that stuff. The problem with meme lab is that it's a little bit like a petri dish, and we want the big real deal. Uh, it's much, much bigger. So here's where the simulation comes in. So I'm going to make a claim here, which is that it's possible to simulate these viral phenomena. I'm going to riff on this for a little while. So even using simple rules, sufficiently large simulations can manifest very sophisticated behaviors. So this broccoli is a fractal. Uh, it's both complex and simple. The pattern's obvious, but the way it manifests is beautiful, and you know it's, a, it's kind of amazing. Such patterns can exist at very large scales, like this mountain range. It can be observed in nature, um, but it can also be modeled mathematically. And in at least one case, a really simple rule might open the doorway to very advanced computation. So Stephen Wolfram, the inventor of Mathematica, noticed a strange pattern of behavior when he was investigating a field of computer science called cellular automata for his book, A New Kind of Science. This little zigzag here is the strange pattern uh, that was later proven, not by Wolfram, but by someone else, to be Turing complete. So more words on what Turing complete means in a moment. But remember here, I'm claiming we can simulate nature, so I'm going to make it a little more abstract before it gets concrete. Now, this is Conway's Game of Life. It's a classic cellular automata simulation that goes like this. When a cell is white, it's alive. If it has fewer than two neighbors next to it, it dies. The same goes if it has more than three neighbors next to it. This is kind of like underpopulation and overcrowding. But if the neighbor has two or three neighbors, the exact right number, it stays alive. And finally, a dead cell with three neighbors next to it can spontaneously come to life. So people discovered that these simple rules provide a really rich medium for experimentation. Just using black and white squares and those rules, it's possible to set up some really interesting chain reactions. This is actually saying the word golly over and over again, but using those exact same rules. The Turing machine is even simpler than what I just showed you because it's just a single strand of black and white squares. It's not a whole two-dimensional matrix. The Turing machine was invented by Alan Turing in the 1930s, and it forms the foundation of all modern computer science. If a machine is shown to be Turing complete, then it's said to, compute, to be able to compute all computable problems. The Turing test, also invented by Alan Turing, even explores the boundary between computation and consciousness, which anticipated one of the great debates in artificial intelligence. The take home from all of this, uh, think of this as being a little bit like computation that you can see. It's not a magical black box. The computation is visually represented in front of you. So instead of four rules, like in the game of life, Stephen Wolfram's rule 110 has eight rules. Uh, this is what they look like 
up here. And you can just type in rule 110 in Wolfram Alpha, and you can see the same stuff for yourself, because uh, you can really interact with this. These eight simple rules are sufficient for performing any computable computation. And it sort of manifests in this strange pattern down here. So what else is possible if you can compute anything then? Well, this is life uh, computing the game of life inside of itself. So this is actually, I think, demonstrating scale independence because as we zoom out, we see that it, you basically have the same thing being computed. And we can zoom out and there's computation inside of the other computation, but you keep zooming out, and, and it's, there's still more. Uh, this is kind of amazing. It's a, a scale-independent computation. And here's life without the boxes. So we're using real numbers instead of integers here. Um, so it's not actually boxes. It's just fluidly moving. And that really looks like it could be alive. It's, it's, it's not. It's just a numerical simulation, of course. But if we broaden the definition of computation, then we could even go so far as to say, and this is a little extreme, but these sand erosion patterns, instead of it, uh, a computer simulating the sand erosion, what if we look at the sand and consider the erosion pattern to be a latent calculation that's being made manifest? The way in which the erosion patterns uh, combine actually behaves a lot like this cellular automata over here. So the broccoli organized its own atoms into this fractal. It did the calculations by itself. And I say nothing changes when we talk about network simulations that are social in nature. So this is what I observed. This really happened in real life with real people. This we're going to call nature. And this is a snapshot of the simulation. In my simulation, each stick figure is using this model of intention to share. So you can't read it, but this is the same picture from before. Intention to share um, is being predicted by, um, it's a linear regression of several features of the memes that people were creating, including whether or not the meme was academic in nature and how funny the person thought it was. And the numbers that actually appear in the, the code for the simulation are taken, uh, so 0.39, over here is taken directly from the slope of the linear model. So we're really taking a linear regression, putting it directly into software, and we're going to run this tens of thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times for each individual agent who's going to be moving around in the simulation. And they're going to be thinking, this is how they're going to calculate their intention to share, or if they want to share. OK, so the following simulation includes 15,000 agents, which can be thought of as approximately representing the UTSC campus population. And I actually appear in the experiment as this enormous zombie character. It's just a gray blob, but it's about four times bigger than the other people. And the, uh, the little people in the experiment, those are participants. And any time one shares with another, that's going to draw an arrow from the one to the other. Um, and now, this is going to go a little quick, but starting in the lower left, there's going to be sort of an explosion that moves towards the center. Um, and you can see all the lines exploding out of it, but you know what? It happens so fast. Here's 50% speed. You can sort of see the experimenter is going to move into the middle, and you can see just the explosion of all of the, uh, uh, the interconnections. But it's really only when you look at the time series that it becomes interpretable. Now, that's the time series. Uh, we overlay it on the uh, actual empirical results. And the truth is, the simulation is not quite there. But the shape is pretty much right. And as it currently exists, the only issue is that the simulation doesn't count up the same total number of hits that we observed in real life. That means the simulation is wrong. But it could, it could definitely be righter. Um, it could be made more right as time goes on. So. Bringing it home, can pictures of kittens explain political revolutions? Well, yeah, I think actually with simulations, we really can bridge these. It's the exact same principles of ideas flowing virally uh, from one person to another. And it doesn't matter if it's a picture of a cat or if it's a, a revolutionary concept. But I think the future is bright. And I want to increase the simulation size to include all 2 billion or 2.2 billion people on the internet. And I also want to get outside of the classroom with Mobile Lab and uh, start conducting research where the students are, like in the science wing cubicles. So thank you, everybody. I, in particular, uh, I want to thank the organizers of the event, uh, my advisor, Jerry Kupchik, also George Cree, my subsidiary advisor, and uh, Elizabeth Page Gould. Um, and you can snap a picture of my business card. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>